Good to see you this morning. We are continuing a series of messages. We've been talking about uh, you got questions, we got answers. It's been some of the whatabouts, especially in regard to morality and the culture that we're living in. These are topics that just aren't real popular sermon topics today in churches. And for a reason, because our culture has gotten so far away from the standard. Uh, culture is always moving farther and farther. You can call it right or left or whatever side you want. They're just moving away from God. Yeah. And uh, day by day goes by, the moral standards are relaxed more and more and until ultimately a culture that continues to live that way comes under the, uh, the uh, judgment or the wrath of God, according to Romans chapter 1. And unfortunately, that's exactly where we are in, in our culture. Today's topic, we're dealing specifically with the topic of homosexuality. We've talked about premarital sex and the moral standards of God. We've talked about adultery. Uh, this Sunday is on homosexuality. Uh, we'll continue this message for a couple more weeks as we talk about moral standards or the lack of moral standards. Someone handed me an article this week, I believe uh, Brother uh, Boyd did. and he came, this, this was from... Uh, an article about the Episcopal Church was meeting, and they're having their, their annual meeting, and the Episcopal bishops okay a trial gay blessing prayer. The Episcopal bishops, the article says, approved an official prayer service for blessing same-sex couples. Monday at their national convention, they also cleared the way for a transgender ordination. At the Episcopal General Convention in Indianapolis, the House of Bishops voted 111 to 41 with three abstentions to authorize a provisional right for same-sex unions for the next three years. I guess this is a trial period. Uh, just, uh, maybe they're trying to figure out what the law is going to do or what, what's acceptable in the community. Who knows? Here's what happens, folks. When people reject a standard, then anything goes reality. When even a, 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 a person, a church, or even a denomination uh, walk away from the, the authority of the Word of God, then anything is, is, is open, everything's okay at that point because there's no... There's no guide anymore. You know, the Bible tells us, uh, I believe Hosea said, the word of God has gone out like a plumb line. If you're in construction, you understand what a plumb line is. It's something you would hold up to a wall. It's a string with a weight on it, and it shows you what, what is up and down, what's directly up and down. So when you bring your wall up, it's not slanted inside or outside or backside. It meets that standard, that plumb line. So the wall is straight and erected properly. All right, You continue to tilt out. If you start with just a little off, it's going to continue to build up and up and up more off as it goes up higher. So the problem is churches as well as individuals, denominations, nations have left off the Word of God. We've rejected truth. And whenever you don't have truth, then you have anything just open to anybody's interpretation of whatever that might be. The Bible makes it very clear what it is and what it means. And it's very clear that it is an authority and that it is the Word of God, that it's infallible and it's inspired of God. It's without error. And it's, it's, it's not to be changed according to Scripture. In fact, there's curses that are written by anybody who might try to alter the Word of God. And today we've come to that fact we wouldn't try to alter it. We just say, you know, uh, God's changed His mind. But God's different now. And so the Episcopal Show, as well as many other mainline denominations in the context of, of that particular article. You may have also caught in the news uh, the issue where Chick-fil-A has been thrust in the, the, to the spotlight by, by the gay rights advocates. Uh, the uh, Chick-fil-A chain is owned by a Christian believer who, who began it with Truett Cathy. His son runs the organization now. And it talked about, uh, we're, we're seeing on the news about the big uproar that the homosexual community as having against and how they've planned and staged a demonstration against Chick-fil-A restaurant because the owners uh, embrace traditional biblical definition of family and they stand in opposition to, to, uh, to the whole gay rights marriage agenda. It, just from the article, it says, uh, the latest uproar began this month when Dan Cathy, whose deeply religious father, S. Truett Cathy, started the company in 1967 and told a Christian news organization that a Chick-fil-A supported the biblical definition of a family unit. Mr. Cathy, the company's president and chief operating officer, said later in a radio interview, as it relates to society in general, I think we're inviting God's judgment on our nation. When we shake it our, our fist at him and say, we know better than you as to what constitutes a marriage. Statements which prompted groups like the National Organization for Marriage to call Mr. Cathy a corporate hero uh, and the ethos that the company has never hidden now being resisted by the homosexual community. In fact, uh, you follow the article through and follow the, the media through. They're planning on August 3rd to have a big uh, uh, homosexual invasion of uh, the Chick-fil-A's where 
they choose to have a kiss in on August 3rd, which prompted uh, Governor Huckabee to say that August 1st, we'd make it an appreciation day for those who stand with uh, Chick-fil-A and, and, and their position. Uh, Rick Santorum kind of answered that and rallied his 200,000 Twitter followers to join him at Chick-fil-A on Wednesday. So on and on it goes, but the idea is that the, the culture is so inundated with such a homosexual agenda anymore, it, there's a revolution going on, whereas to get the, the cultural bent to, to a mindset that there's nothing really wrong with homosexuality. That it's really just an alternative lifestyle. It's a, it's a sexual preference. It's an orientation or even perhaps a, a genome problem. You've got a gene that, that makes you that particular way. Uh, but whatever it is, it's, 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 a, it's a massive movement. I remember in 73, 1973, some of you don't know what that yet was, uh, I was around uh, giving my life to Jesus that year. And I remember uh, hearing of Jerry Falwell in those days, who was leading a, a big pro uh, Live pro family and uh, influencing, trying to influence government and officials to, to make biblical standard the standard which we, we live our lives by, and at least to kind of impose into the political arena a Christian voice. A lot of people laughed at him, especially when he talked about the cultural warfare that the homosexuals would be bringing over the next several decades. And everything he said in that regard has come true. There is this cultural revolution that's going on by uh, uh, the homosexual community to pretty much just standardized, standardized uh, homosexual relationships as any, any other kind of heterosexual relationship. Uh, if you, if, I, I was amazed that even reading the articles and the arguments about Chick-fil-A that one of the aldermen from the city of Chicago, uh, Alderman Marino, uh, said he would not move forward on land use legislation that the company has to have passed before they can open a Chick-fil-A in, in the city of Chicago. Uh, Friday, the mayor of Chicago, Menino, uh, I mean the mayor of Boston, sent a letter to Mr. Kathy telling his company was not welcome in Boston because of their particular stand on this issue. Who'd ever thought you can't even have a freedom of speech in America? You can't tell what your opinion is. He's not condemning anybody. He's not, you know, he's just saying, hey, this is what I believe. And now we want to have an uproar about that. Uh, then there, I saw it again, follow the news closely. There's always something every day about in the news in these regards. Just family groups, uh, uh, an article came out, agree with the Boy Scouts of America. I mean, you know, the Boy Scouts of America have recently voted not to allow uh, lesbian leaders or homosexual gay men to be leaders of the Boy Scouts and also said that they would not accept the practice of homosexuality among the boys that would be attending that they'd be rejected. And then there's the national outcry. They say it's a national, it's the homosexual community. Outcry against the Boy Scouts of America because they want to embrace as a private, non-profit institution their own set of values. It's one thing to hear constantly from the homosexual community how we need to be tolerant. But on the other hand, boy, there's no tolerance here, is there? None whatsoever. And then J.C. Penney, for you have stock there, I'm a little sorry. Because your stocks are failing, and this particular article talks about since announcing in February that J.C. Penney uh, uh, would, would allow a homosexual activist and comedian Ellen DeGeneres to uh, be their spokesperson, that stocks have begun to fail and to fall. Standard Poor's rating service lowered its credit rating to J.C. Penney into a junk status. Uh, and to, according to an action alert released by today's American Family Association, the retailer stock price in February was $41.32 a share. Now it's down to $20.02 $20 a share. Part of the problem has been, well, amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Part of the problem has been the fact that J.C. Penney has become very activist-oriented for the homosexual community in their advertising. If you saw the Mother's Day advertising or the Father's Day advertising in their catalogs, it featured in the Mother's Day, it was two gay women. And the Father's Day had two gay men. And part of the commercials on TV were like, you know, uh, what's better than have one dad who really loves you? And the, and the kids then says, I have two dads so, that love me. And so it's, it's, uh, they were saying since that's happened, they fired their marketing uh, director at that point because things are not going so well in that regard. Target donating sales, I saw another article this week, says Target's placed $120,000 in cash to promote the legislation of homosexual marriage. Target says it uh, will donate 100% of t-shirt sales from the customers during the month of June to Family Equal Equality Council. Uh, so they're promising and pledging their support to the homosexuals. We've seen Home Depot take pretty much the same stand. We've got a lot of corporations that are coming out and, and uh, promoting the homosexual agenda as an acceptable, and many corporations are now are, are leaning with their advertising and marketing to these particular groups. Well, the, the, the series of messages is what about? 
So let's ask, what does the Bible say about? What is God's answer to, to, the, to this, this cultural phenomenon that seems to be just raging and roiling through our country? What is God's answer to, that, to, 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 to homosexual issues? And, and by the way, in, in view of a, the continuous pressure from the homosexual community to impose itself as a natural and normal lifestyle, I think it's important that we as the church more than ever deal with these kind of issues. That we who would embrace the truth of God's word stand on the word of God. You say, well, you know, we're being judgmental. We're not being judgmental to say this is what God says, all right? God is the judge. We're not the judge. We can only say, here's what the Lord says, and you can choose to do whatever you want to do in the privacy of your bedroom, but there are some things that will cost you in the long run. And if you stand against God and God's word, then there's going to be a price to pay for that. And since I do care about people and I do love people, whether they're homosexual or straight or whatever, I would like you to know what the Bible says and what the truth is. Now, Romans 1 is one of those thesis kind of things on this issue that law, Paul is writing prior to his journey to, into Rome. And remember, Paul says, I'm coming to Rome in this letter. It's kind of like saying, you know, I'm going to Washington or I'm going to Hollywood. He makes his announcement. As he goes through the first of Romans chapter 1, there's that, my favorite verse in all the Bible where he says, and by the way, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation. Now, he's going to the place which is the center of uh, influence, like a, a Washington or a Hollywood might be. He's going to a place where cultural mindset is constantly being shaped. And we know that the media today is shaping the mindset of our culture. And so he's going to a place like this. And, you know, he may go in and he says he has a problem with his speech. He may go in as a stuttering, stammering preacher of the gospel. But he's talking about a carpenter who was crucified on a cross, who has the power to change lives. And his word is sure and it's secure and it's settled for all time. Rome is the center of the world's power. It's the place where the educated, the philosophers, the cultural leaders are, the theologians. And there he goes into the midst of all that saying, I'm coming. And when I come, I'm preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he begins his letter in Romans chapter 1. We're not going to read it off. I'll show you some scriptures in a moment as we get into that. But he, he begins his letter and he's talking about the revealed glory of God. How that God has made it obvious to him, to, to man, that there's a God. In fact, even the heavens declare the glory of God. The things around us, those things that are created, we ought to be able to see that God's been involved here. This is, we see the creative power of God. That and These things don't come by accident, as, of course, the evolutionists would have you believe today. It says God is making himself clear. And as he gets down into Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 17 and uh, 3, and he goes all the way to... Uh, uh, Romans, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 17, and he goes through chapter 3, and he gets in all the way through 3, verse 19. He's sharing this particular message that God has revealed himself, that he's over all things, <clears throat> and that man is a sinner. And he talks about the Jews are sinner, the Gentiles are sinner. He says all of sin. In fact, that's where he kind of concludes that in Romans 3, that all are guilty before God. In Romans, he, he makes it clear on a couple of places, chapter 1, that, hey, the wrath of God is revealed against, from heaven against all ungodliness. In fact, his discourse on man's sin and man's guilt and God's glory, you know, it all begins there in chapters 1 and 2. A lot of people call Romans chapters 1 and 2 the gospel of wrath, all right? Because he's dealing with topics in there that God's judgment is against. In fact, he's dealing with topics in there that are common topics in today's culture. And he kind of declares, then kind of, he declares the end result of man choosing his own way is that he enters into a moral decay and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, ultimately leading from immorality to fornication to adultery, ultimately leading to homosexuality. And he addresses it as a sin. He addresses this issue of homosexuality, the homosexual sin. He calls it this, in one place, sodomy. The, the, the problem that they're facing in the culture, the issue is sodomy. Now, we're living in a world that's accepted sodomy as a real and acceptable and alternative lifestyle. But if you do a little historical study, if you go back and see that the American Psychiatric Association used to describe sodomy as a deviant behavior between people. In fact, prior to 1973, homosexuality was listed as a mental and an emotional disorder. Now, I've always had a problem with the American Psychiatric Association to begin with, all right? Because prior to 1973, God had said it was a sin. All right, he, he just said, he didn't say it was an emotional disorder. He didn't say it was a mental disorder. He just said it's a sin. Just as he said lying is a sin, and cheating is a sin, and stealing is a sin, and all these other things are sin. Today, 
you know, people uh, like the American Society of uh, Psychiatric Association, they've changed their position. <clears throat> now uh, it's an acceptable sexual orientation accepted by our culture. Let me read you from the King James Version, Romans 1, 26 through 27. It says, For this cause God gave them up into vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward the other, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of the heir, which was meat. Now let's look at that from the English Standard Version. For this reason... God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged the natural relationships for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and they were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Interesting. Now this is what the Bible has to say. The inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. What does the Bible say? Well, one, it says homosexuality is a sin. Everything related to it, whether it's men or women, is related to it, it's a sin. Romans 1.26 said it is vile. Un unthinkably filthy is what that word means. Verse 27 says the word in the King James, unseemly. This is defined as a word which means indecent abomination filled with disgraceful shame. And that's clarity from Scripture about what homosexuality is. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 24 through 28, we have the destructions of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's given, given a clear illustration of what took place there. We see the story laid out of what happened. In fact, Peter explained the judgment upon these two cities was to serve as, as an example. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, Peter says, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Why were Sodom and Gomorrah, why were these cities chosen to be an example of God's ultimate judgment? Why were they set forth to be how God shows his judgment upon people that are unbelievers and are ungodly? I mean, what were they doing that made them so different from the other ungodly cities that were around them? Peter says they had a grievous sin. There was a grievous sin that God judged. What was that grievous sin? Now, I have heard... Theology lessons from homosexual preachers and teachers uh, that kind of explain this grievous sin that deserved the judgment of God is something else. In fact, if you listen to them explain it, they explain that the sin for Sodom and Gomorrah was their lack of hospitality. Their lack, they were just inhospitable one to another. So God poured out judgment upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, don't laugh at this because even though it is laughable, this is what is being taught in many circles. In fact, Richard Bateman sent me a link that's really going around Facebook. There's a popular link of a, a young man who's getting up and espousing all the things that, you know, that are misunderstood from the Bible about homosexuality. And this kind of fell in that category, this Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, I read from an, an, uh, an article that was written by the, the pastor of a, of a gay church, homosexual church, that basically said the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was in hospitality. All right? So the next time someone's rude to you, you say, quit sodomizing me. Maybe you better not. <laughs> Here's the explanation in brief that was given by the pastor. First, the judgment of these cities for their wickedness had been announced prior to the alleged homosexual incidents. That made about that much sense to me, too. Since God already said he's going to judge them before the incident, you know, because he's sending the angels down to warn Lot that judgment's coming, they think they hadn't done anything with what they were doing, which, you know, non no logic whatsoever. Second of all, they went on to say, all of Sodom's people participate in the assault on Lot's house, and in no culture has more than a small minority of the population been homosexual. So since <clears throat> there's no, no place in culture where we see uh, in history where, there, where we see a census that's been taken that shows the majority of the population is in that city is homosexual, that, then that relates to, well, God's obviously saying that's the problem here. And the, you might not have taken a census. We, not see, we may not see the percentage, but obviously the majority of the people in this city are coming out. Because remember, Lot was getting a warning from God that judgment was coming for the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he sent his angels to be messengers to Lot to announce to him the fact that this judgment was coming. The men and the women of the city, the people of the city, they wanted to come out and molest these angelic beings. Well, the, the explanation goes on. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> Lot's offer to release his daughters suggests he knew his neighbors to have uh, heterosexual tendencies. 
You remember Lot went out and he says, don't do this kind of thing to these men or to here. Uh, take my daughters instead, which is kind of, you know, insane to begin with. And so they're saying since Lot offered his daughters to these people at the door, that, uh, that proved that they were heterosexuals. Well, again, it's a bad argument because they didn't want the daughters. All right, if you, you read the story. Fourth, if the issue was sexual, why did God spare Lot who immediately committed a sin of incest? More importantly, why did all the passages of scriptures, other passages of scriptures that refer to this account of Sodom and Gomorrah, why do they fail to raise the issue of homosexuality? Well, you don't really have to be a great linguist, just have a good Bible dictionary and read the scriptures and you'll see that all those other things do talk about this grievous sin. And if you study them in the context of what's being said, it's very clear what's being said. Genesis 18 says, And the Lord said, Because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grievous. Let's just consider this, this, this case just for a moment and look at the text. All right, Genesis 19, 4. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, young and old, and all the people from every quarter surrounded Lot's house. All right, now notice here, first of all, that there's this participation from all the people of the city seeking to participate in whatever the sin's going to be. And it's obviously going to deal with molestation and it's sexual in its orientation. Because to say that it's just inhospitable, then why are they rejecting Lot's daughters and saying, we want these men that you've brought in, these strangers to us? All right, and they called Lot and they said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Now, part of the argument here says, well, that word carnally is not in the original text. No, it didn't. It was added by the, supplied by the translators along with the word that is in the text, which is the word know. Bring them out so that we may know them. The word know is used here is most many times a euphemism for knowing somebody in a sexual way. Go back to Genesis where it says Adam knew Eve. That means they were more than Facebook friends. All right? They just weren't tweeters together, all right? They had a sexual relationship and they bore sons as a result. They bore children as a result of knowing one another. So Lot's reaction to the crowd suggests that he understands exactly what this crowd is requesting. Genesis 19, 6 says, So Lot went out to them through the door and then he shut the door behind him and said, please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Apparently, Lot understands that their intentions are certainly not honorable. In fact, the next statement by Lot is hard to understand, but it better expresses his, his concept of hospitality and that he was willing to suffer personal loss than allow what was getting ready to happen to happen to his guest. He said, I have two daughters that have not known a man. Please, let me bring them out to you that you may... Do to them as you wish, but do nothing to these men. These were, these were holy angels. They're messengers of God. Do nothing to these men since that is the reason they've come under the shadow of my roof. They've come here for my protection. You can't do anything to them. I mean, yeah, it is amazing. Lot offers his daughters. It confirms to me the fact that he understood the, the intentions of this crowd were not honorable. They were sexual in their nature. And he, he explains that the, the, the original hospitality to the strangers was his to protect them from any kind of this homosexual rape that was getting ready to take place. That was in, it was the intent of the crowd. Well, here's the crowd's response. And it, sound, it kind of sounds like the response today when you say anything about homosexuality. They said, stand back, shut up. This one came into sojourn, talking about Lot. He doesn't really live here. Remember, he, he chose to live there as a result of Abraham and picking places where they're going to live. And he, he keeps acting like he's a judge. We're going to do worse with you than with him. So they pressed hard against Lot and they came near to break down the door. Now, here's the response. Whenever you say anything in regards to homosexuality in our culture, who are you to judge? Well, who made you the, who died and made you the judge? Who appointed you the judge? Who made you the standard bearer? Nobody made us the, the, the standard bearer. God is the standard. We just hold it up. And we don't have to judge. The Bible says all men are already judged. And the only way to escape the judgment is the cross. Amen. Who are you to tell us what to do? You're not judging them. The Word of God is the Word that's sent out to all of us. It is a Word which brings life or it brings death. It's a Word which brings hope or it brings, it's heaven or hell. And the Word of God gives us this clarity. In return, you know, they themselves are trying to avoid the condemnation that the messengers of God are bringing by condemning the messenger himself. And this is, you know, Lot standing there saying, hey, I'm here to protect you. You know, they're going to judge him. 
anytime people usually stand to, to, to raise up a standard, they're always seeking for something to destroy that standard. And you may find fault in, in, in yourself, and you may find fault in me, but you'll never find fault in the Word of God. It's just not there. And the homosexuality that they're talking about here is obviously, Peter said, this is a grievous sin. And, he, and the Lord's referring to the sins of Genesis 18 and 20. He says, this is a grievous sin. And it becomes more apparent when you do study the other places in Scripture exactly what it's talking about. In the New Testament, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, here's what Jude writes, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. They are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude's making it clear that this was an issue of immorality. He's making it clear that they're going after strange flesh. Strange was that these men were not, they were not men as we know men. These were angelic beings, all right? And by the way, I don't see any female angels in Scripture. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Because I know every picture and every little statuette we see of angels, 90% of them are females. But, you know, I, I read through the Bibles and I see angels, and they always are presented as male characters with male names. Now, we know in heaven there's no marrying, no giving in marriage, and all that thing's irrelevant in the kingdom of God. But ultimately, they're after those messengers who appear as men. I mean, Gabriel, that doesn't sound like maybe Gabriella, but the angel's name was Gabriel. There's Michael. There's Lucifer, who's a fallen angel. So... Understand the context where these people are coming after. They, they want to have relationships with these men who are different than they are, and they want to be involved in them in some way so for whatever pleasure that they think they're going to derive for that. But Jude is saying, hey, this is an ungodly sin. He describes the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Obviously, it's a sexually immoral situation. And it doesn't say anything in Second Peter. It doesn't say anything in Jude. And it really doesn't say anything in Genesis about inhospitality. And only people who are desperate to justify the conduct of their life would try, would fail to see what the Bible says so as to somehow justify the way that they're living their life. In fact, if you look at the Old Testament, you know, homosexual conduct was a capital crime under the law of Moses. I'm sorry, I'm, I, you know, not just because of that, but folks, I'm glad we're, we're not under that law of Moses because the, ex, the punishments are, are instant and they're extreme, all right? They're instant. And they're, some of you who committed certain sins in, in your life that were, they were exposed and you'd have been stoned to death or, or surely put to death. We are under, praise God, a covenant of grace as the children of God. And if you look in Scripture, and even in the New Covenant, there, there are harsh punishments for similar crimes throughout the Scripture. But they're, they're delayed. And they're delayed until the day of judgment. You go back to, you know, the Scriptures and you read about the wrath that's to come and the judgment that's to come and the great right throne of judgment. Judgment's going to be poured out, the Bible says, on all ungodliness. Now, Paul was writing to the Romans. And he said, you remember, though, the law, though you may not be under it, it is still holy. And the commandment of the law is holy and just and it's good. And he said later, it was written that we could learn. It was like a teacher for us. And it teaches us what God's like and what God's for. And that God is holy and God is righteous and exposes the holiness of God. At the same time, with the Ten Commandments, so to say, we see our unholiness. When God says, thou shalt not sin, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery, on and on it goes, we see how unholy man can be. And God gives us the law in His law, in his law to show us his, his righteousness and that He's virtuous and that He's high and He's separate and He's unique and He's pure. He's righteous and that we are not righteous. You understand what the Scripture says in this regard. It's, it's important that judgment will come one day for all ungodliness. But Leviticus 18, 22, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Now, can that be any clearer? I mean, homosexual conduct is an abomination to the Lord. Go down to Leviticus 18, along with bestiality. Now, folks, the next thing you can be sure of, that in the culture that we're living in, that the next item on the agenda, if the Lord delays His coming, will be to, you know, to somehow uh, take the sin of bestiality and make it an acceptable practice in our culture. I don't believe that. Well, you wouldn't believe what was going on right now for you that have lived as long as I have, that this would be going on in our culture today. 
And this is what Paul's making clear in Romans 1. Things just get worse and worse. You do more, you do more. In fact, if you study this issue and look carefully why God judged the Canaanites and gave that land to Israel was that this is one of the sins, the, the sexual sins. And you can go back to Leviticus 18 and read through it, you know, that God was judging the land for these particular sins. And this is mentioned. In, in fact, in Leviticus 18, 26 through 30, the Israelites were warned that if you participate in this particular sin, I'll vomit you out of the land. More is said about it in the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 13. <clears throat> if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In fact, according to the New Testament, uh, we're not under the law of Moses. But what we learn here is that while the law was in effect, without question, homosexuality clearly was a grave offense worthy of death. That's what the Bible teaches. Well, let's look at the New Testament. It becomes really clear in the New Testament that there's a condemnation on homosexual lifestyle, homosexual conduct. Listen to what Paul wrote. The Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write in 1 Corinthians 6. <clears throat> Do you not know <coughs> excuse me, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. There's the underlying word today because everybody's trying to deceive us. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, a lot of people want to stop right there and skip the next ones. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he's some pretty clear terminology he's using. In fact, Paul uses two terms that are translated in that passage, homosexual and sodomite. The first time term translated for homosexual, the King James uses the word effeminate, all right? And it is the word malakos. Thayer's Theological Dictionary defines that particular word effeminate as a male who submits his body to unnatural lewdness. Now, what does it mean unnatural? It means a man and a woman were made in a natural way, all right, to bond together. A man and a man were not made that way, all right? It's what's natural and what's unnatural. When you read Romans chapter 1, it says they gave themselves over to unnatural, that which is against nature for mankind, for humanity. So the first word, effeminate, is malakos. The second term uh, is, is translated sodomites, uh, abusers of themselves with mankind, is the word arsenikotai, and I, probably not the proper definition in the Greek, but Thayer des describes this particular word as one who lies with a male as with a female, a sodomite. So Paul's warning here, first of all, is don't let anybody deceive you. Don't be deceived. And it's appropriate, obviously, for today. For there are these homosexual teachers and preachers and theologians that have you to believe that Paul was only, and this is one of the things you see in a lot of their, their, their publicity and a lot of their information, Paul is just, he's just, you know, condemning male prostitution. In fact, when you look at the first word malakos, that word did mean in the Greek, it properly spoke of male prostitutes. That's what it meant. But that second word described any sort of unnatural homosexual conduct. And despite people trying to twist the word of God and twist the scripture so as to deceive themselves as well as many other people, on the other hand, the Bible is very clear when you take it in the total context and you look at what it says, you know, that anybody who continues to gave, engage in this homosexual lifestyle and in sodomites or malachos, either one of them, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those theologians would have you believe that all that's being condemned in scriptures is male prostitution, doing it for money, and that the other way is all right. Just as those who would try to tell you in that same so-called Christian venue, if you're a Christian and you're homosexual, it's all right, but just make sure it's a monogamous relationship. Now, folks, I just want to make it clear. Homosexuality is a sin, all right? Now, if stealing's a sin and homosexuality is a sin, that means that I can only, I must have a monogamous relationship with my homosexuality. That, I guess that just means I can only steal from people I know. Yeah. Closely. <laughs> you know, if you're going to draw one parameter, then you have to apply it to all. If you're going to use one formula, then you have to apply it across the board. But the issue is we don't want to say it's a sin. There's the big problem. It's not a sin. Well, you know, we, we don't have sins anymore. We have diseases and things and alternatives. And, 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 you know, we just won't recognize what the Word of God says so that the Scriptures are twisted. But, you know, the, the hope of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, when he lays out all that is verse 6, of chapter 11, he says, but such were some of you. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, but such were some of you. 
In other words, those people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Praise God, you got your, your heart right with God, and he changed your life, and now you're no longer those things. You're not a drunkard. You're not a reviler, all right? You were that. I were a drunkard. I were a, excuse me, I know I'm saying it improperly, just for emphasis sake. I was a drug addict. That's what I was. But I got saved. You say, why were you that way? It was in my genes. <laughs> my mother wasn't very nice. I, had a, I, had a, I, I, I was raised in a home where he had a very strong mother image over a father image. Or my environment. You know, it's just the way I was brought up. It's my, and I can blame all those things. The problem is nobody wants to accept personal responsibility for that sin word. It's a sin. And we'll look at that. I want to say it just a bit clearer. But in 1 Timothy, there's this, this, this explanation where he's talking about things that are, not, that, are, that are contrary to the word of God. And Paul used that word again in, in 1 Timothy. And I don't have the scripture up there, but here's what he talks about things that are contrary. And he talked about this word, you know, for unnatural use of men with men. This ar arsenicoitai is the, the generic term for homosexual. Is a, con is a conduct which is contrary to what's sound in scripture. 1 Timothy, verse 9 says, Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, in other words, made to show us that we're rebellious, for the ungodly, I qualify, for sinners. Hey, count me in. Paul said, I'm chief, amen? He said, and for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or their mothers, for murders. The guy in Colorado, everybody's going to come up, why he did it? Why he did it? He's a murderer. He chose to be a murderer, all right? He gave in to that. You can come up with all the reasons and all the specifications and have 42 different talk shows on it, but the guy's a murderer. All right, he says, you know, the, the murderers. And he said, the law was also given for immoral men and homosexuals. And that's that word, you know what it is. I can say it again. <laughs> he said, for homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of our blessed God, which I've been entrusted. He said, according to the word of God that God's given me, these things are sin. Pretty clear, isn't it? The sound doctrine of the gospel of Christ condemns these relationships between unmarried heterosexuals. It shouldn't be hard to understand that sex between unmarried homosexuals is wrong. And it's wrong between, even though the law describes marriage now in a very broad sense in many states, it's still wrong. Because God gives us a, a definition of what marriage is. He, he verifies it in Genesis 2 when he brings Adam and Eve together. In Matthew 19, he tells us between a man and a woman. He talks about what adultery is. We reject truth. I mean, the classical passage which deals with the sin of homosexual conduct is Romans 1, verses 18 through 28. And you can read all of that a little bit later. But it summarizes saying that the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who do what? They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They say it's not what it means or it's not for today or God has changed his mind. You know, we've talked about open theism before where people believe that God's still changing rules and changing his mind about things. Or we think that somehow that God is not... Immutable. Immutable means that when God said, I'm the Lord God, I don't change. We think, well, I'm the Lord God and I change occasionally. But that's not what he says. Three times in this passage in Romans 1, he talks about <coughs> this expression, God gave them up or God gave them over. Romans 1, 24, 126, and 128. And the point gets real clear if you study those passages that when people choose to reject God and choose to reject truth, they recreate God in their own image, as it goes on to say, or they worship and serve themselves, or they worship and serve idols. It says God gives them up to go their own way. God gives them up to go. You, have, you, you, you just go do it. That's the way you want to live. God's not going to stop you in the process. But you have to lie to the Word of God and to yourself God's basic principle of righteousness have remained constant throughout different periods of Bible history. For example, one, adultery has always been sin and condemned by God. Two, fornication, premarital sex, has always been sin and been condemned by God. Homosexuality has been identified in the time of the patriarchs <coughs> as a grievous sin. Under the law of Moses... It was considered an abomination, shameful, indicative of a debased mind, contrary to sound doctrine, according to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Just like all sin, though, it must be forsaken. Lying, cheating, 
premarital sex, adultery, all sin, not a disease. And I don't want you to miss this important fact, that according to the Bible, all the world is guilty before God. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And with every one of us is the capacity to commit any sin. And what Paul is making this point in Romans 1, he says, if you choose to reject God and the truth, the further you run from him, the deeper you're going to fall into the recesses of sin. There's no one to blame. Not dominant mothers, not homosexual genes, not society, not environment, not your sexual orientation. You just choose to commit this sin. But I'm tempted, so it must be my nature. Your nature's fallen. All our natures until we come to Christ are fallen. It's in the bondage of sin. The pseudo-intellectual says, you know, well, what about the innocent lost heathen who haven't heard the gospel? Now, they like to bring that in, don't they? Yeah. Well, folks, let me tell you. The Bible says all, everybody's guilty. There's no innocent heathens anymore. There's any innocent cultured people, modernized people. All guilty, none innocent. Romans 3.19, all the world is guilty before God, Jews, Gentiles, everyone. At the same time, forgiveness is available to all. I love 1 Corinthians 6 where he talked about that list. And then he went into that next verse and said, but such were some of you. There's the past tense. In fact, Romans 1.32, it, it, uh, it concludes at the end of Romans there that the whole world is guilty before God and under the wrath of God and hell bound. Very full of sinners all headed for hell. But you look at 1 Corinthians, he, Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, he says it concludes with a barrel of that whole ungodly group saved and heaven bound because they put their faith in Christ. You, you turn from your sin and you turn to Christ. That's repentance. But see, we're having a world today where there's such an emphasis where people want to keep their sin. I want to embrace my sin, but I still want to go to heaven. So I'm going to have a little religion in my life. Whether I'm the Episcopal or the Baptist or whatever denomination or abomination might be, I, you know, it's all right because I've justified this. No, it's sin. Whether you're sitting here in this room today and it's been your lifestyle or not, you know, doesn't make, whether you've done it or not, it's still sin, all right? It's sin that needs to be confessed. Whether you're watching the, via our media sites or websites or YouTube, it's still sin. It's a choice you make. Well, I just feel this is my orientation because this is the way I'm bent. This is the way I seem to, I, I, this is what I want. <laughs> you know, I, I want to slap people in the face sometime. <laughs> Am I the only one? No. no. <laughs> but it's not right. It wouldn't be hospitable. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do something just because you feel like it's something you want to do. I mean, you know, I like smoking dope. <laughs> you know? But I don't do it anymore. Is wrecking my life and ruining my life. That might surprise some folks. <laughs> but let's agree with what the scripture says. Paul made the sinners list, and then he said, Of whom I am chief. Yes. I can do anything anybody else can do with the best of them or the worst of them. God's grace is, is so powerful. You get, a, you get a little glimpse of the Garden of Eden, there's Jesus. Surrendering himself to the will of Father to become all sin. No wonder, he said, as he looked in that cup, that dredge of the filth and the wickedness of humanity and all the sins of humanity, he says, oh, if there's any way, let this pass from me. No wonder. But he embraced that and he drank it completely. And he who knew no sin became all our sin. The sum total of every ungodly thing, every ungodly thought, every ungodly deed, every ungodly act, the wrath that was poured out on Jesus Christ so that we can join the crowd in 1 Corinthians 6, 10 and say, hey, praise God, such were some of I of the list. But now I'm in Christ. For if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. Praise God. That's the power of the gospel to deliver us. Can deliver me from the bondage of my sin, and deliver you from the bondage of your sin. God's no respecter of persons. Will I ever be tempted again? Yeah, I get tempted all the time. But I don't have to anymore. We've been set free. Do I live a sinless life? No. But I can tell you, folks, once you make a commitment to Jesus Christ, those massive issues that were in your life, they'll fall like conquered castles. And your biggest struggle will be with some of the smaller things in your life. The grace of God is so far reaching and so powerful. If people but simply turn their hearts, their minds, and their lives to him and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Come into my life, make me new. Every sinful act will be forgiven. And the very nature, your being, 
that was the source, the dirty heart of unbelief that was the source for all that bad fruit in your life, you can be transformed. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. He's still saving people. He's still changing people. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can choose. But you can choose for righteousness. And you can choose for life. You can choose for Jesus. But don't expect this world to embrace you. I told my wife the other day, we were sitting there, and I think we were driving somewhere, and we, I was thinking about national revival. God, we need national revival. I was listening to some of the reports coming across the media and all the things that are wrong in our culture and our nation. I said, God, we need you to move. But I, folks, I will let you know right now, if God were to move in a great way within the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, those people truly born again, he's going to create a lot of havoc first. You better be ready to face the persecution if you're going to really stand up and live for Jesus. You better be willing to stand like Lot and say, do no harm. You better be ready to stand up and just say, hey, I've made a commitment. You can call me judgmental if you want. I'm just saying what I've been called to do in the life I'm going to choose to live. But I really believe if we do see a revival within the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to come persecution first before it has a chance to pour over into the other areas of our national life. It's going to come with rejection because we have a lot of people who are the apostates of the end times. They're not going to get right with God, and they don't want to get right with God. In fact, they're some of the ones who laugh at all that Christianity supposes to believe. And they mock and they ridicule. And there'll always be those ridiculers, and there'll always be those mockers. Even as there were in the other great outpourings that we've seen in history of God's Spirit. So I really believe if we do see revival, which I'm praying for, and I hope you are, it may come with some persecution to start with. Maybe some lost jobs, maybe some ridicule, maybe some people thrown in jail, being called judgmental, intolerant, uncaring, unloving. Just because we said, I'm just not going to live that way, and I'm not going to embrace that philosophy of life. Read the book of Colossians. Paul, keep pointing the charge.